I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and this is State of Mind. We would like to thank the Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel for their partnership in this season's production. The Youth Channel is a cable and multimedia platform that focuses on highlighting media created by youth for youth while providing a pipeline for action. We're kicking off a two-part series today entitled The Corner of the Court. The Corner of the Court project is a program created by Rashna Baid, a psychologist and organizational leadership specialist dedicated to the research and reinforcement of men's important and vital role in diversity. The project features the stories of men who have influenced a woman's career or professional life told by women. Men learn success strategies for being advocates and women share success stories of their careers, highlighting the importance of male advocates. In the process, it builds self-confidence of male advocates who are doing supportive things, big or small, while building visibility to women's own successes across a variety of industries. Today's topic will focus on the female perspective. Shauna, thanks so much for joining us on State of Mind. Thank you, Krishna, for having me. Now, this is a great topic, one that I feel very strongly about, but I think for a lot of people, we're still trying to understand why is it so important to research a topic like male allies? Well, um, the topic of male allies is something that is you're seeing a lot more uh, in industry and also on college campuses because of the important role that men have always played and will continue to play in supporting gender equality and inclusive environments. So I've been doing this type of work um, as a leadership consultant for about 18 years. And certainly, in order to make great leaders today and also great leaders of the future, being in tune to the topic of workplace equality is really important. Uh, the role of male allies in particular is one that hasn't really been looked at um, in great detail. A lot of men um, don't necessarily know that they have a role to play but women readily invite them to the table and want them to play the role. So the research that I do in the unique aspect of the corner of the court attempts to bridge um, both the male and the female perspective so that we can make men great leaders of diversity. So help me understand, what exactly is the corner of the court? So the corner of the court is a metaphor, but a very literal example of an experience that I had when I was 12 years old as the only girl on a team, a tennis team of all boys. And I had spent that whole summer being trained to compete, play against boys who were much bigger than me and much bigger than I was. And my coach was my older brother. And so when I talk about the corner of the court, when I talk about my research really in male allies and how any man can really access a, a relationship that he's had with a woman, um, even from, childhood, right. uh, that's a metaphor that really tends to stick really well because it's um, something that everyone can relate to. It's a tennis court and where you stand on the court, whether you're the athlete or the coach, right. um, can spark a lot of great discussion. So it's a metaphor for life, not just the professional life, but the personal one as well. It, absolutely, absolutely. So the concept of mentorship is one we throw around in academia, in the professional setting, even in our own personal lives. Help me understand, or at least level set to our audience, what your definition of mentorship is. And then secondly, talk to me about how hard it is to find a mentor, and is there a difference between a male and female mentor in terms of what they can and cannot do? Yeah, so mentors, I will say just right off the bat, I love that you asked the question because mentors are extraordinarily important regardless of whether you're starting out in your career or you're 20, 30, 40 years in. Mm -hmm. um, mentors can look and come in different uh, types of relationships. So sometimes there are formal mentoring relationships that companies will put in place to give access to top leadership or to experienced mm. um, employees for people who are just starting out, as one example. Um, there are also mentoring relationships that just kind of happen organically, mm. whereby you meet someone who has experience in a field that you're interested or might be in a completely different field and you kind of strike a relationship that way that allows the mentor to take kind of the protege under their wing. There's also a kind of subset of mentorship called sponsorship, which is mm. also very, very important. Certainly, I think also as your viewers go into the workplace, which is sponsorship is really an intentional um, uh, relationship based on a position of influence. So um, it's like having a mentor who can open doors for mm. you and have a seat at the table. And all of our stories, so the corner of the court project is stories of women telling stories of great male mentors or advocates. Um, we have a lot of examples of men who have used their power for good to advocate on behalf of uh, the woman telling the story. So you mentioned our audience, and our audience are typically 
uh, individuals between the ages of 17 and 22, the college environment. Um, so if I'm a young individual female at in a college setting, uh, how do I find a, a mentor, male or female, for my professional, professional or personal life? And where do I go? Where do I start? Well, I think that college, the college campus is a great place to begin building the skills that, again, you will need 20, 30 years into your career as well to be able to seek out who would be great, a great mentor for you. Um, certainly, I can speak from my own experience. My, one of my thesis advisors when I was at University of Virginia doing my undergrad, she was a great mentor to me. Um, she was an advisor. Again, that's a great example of a formal relationship. Right. Um, certainly, if you're in a sorority um, and you have the access to upperclassmen, that's also a mentorship relationship because they can then, three years down the road, take you under their wing, um, whether you're working for them or not. Um, certainly as, as guidance. I think you would ask the question also, Christian, about male mentors. Right. And that can be, again, certainly if you have male professors, then that can be an easy way to, um, or a straightforward way to build a relationship. Go to office hours, right. um, have a very intentional reason why you're reaching out to them. Um, but a lot of the mentorship and the male allyship that we see in our stories are friendships. Really? So um, I would really encourage women, even not even, but especially at the, the kind of 17 to 22 year old mark where you're on a college campus, right. who are the guys that are really able to kind of give you a perspective about work or school topics mm. that you can then continue to lean on? So I, I alluded to this, but I'll be more direct. Does it make a difference what gender mm. they are? the mentors that is uh, yeah absolutely absolutely because if you're looking at sponsorship aside where sponsorship is again that's a kind of um, a s an opportunity for someone in a position of power right. to lift someone up and unfortunately more men are still in those positions of power um, that looks very different for men and women um, mentorship also it, it makes a difference whether you have a man mentoring you or a woman mentoring you if you're a female mm -hmm. um, there can be some element of feeling as though, you know, we hear this term mansplaining. Could you take a second <laughs> to actually explain that for our, our audience? So you've certainly never done this to me, Krishna, <laughs> um, but mansplaining is kind of a colloquial term for um, a man explaining something to a woman that she already knows. So and it's a little bit um, condescending. condescending. Okay. Yeah, it's condescending, but the intention is, is it's unconscious. Okay. So that's one of the things that when we talk about diversity, you know, I give I give a break to people because a lot of these behaviors that we we experience as women, the guys might not even know that they're doing. Really. So too on the flip side, the guys might not know they're doing good things, which is what the project is is right. built off right. of. Um, but to your question, um, there's a whole kind of manual actually. Um, actually, there's a literal manual called Athena Rising, written by two okay. professors at the uh, United States Naval Academy about how men can be effective mentors to women so that they avoid things like mansplaining, um, avoid crossing boundaries that might not be um, welcome, mm -hmm. and also how they can be more effective in mentoring someone of a different gender. Okay, so you've worked in a variety of industries, fashion, financial services, consulting, consumer goods. What is the current corporate work environment like for a woman, especially for our audience who are potentially going to be graduating and looking for their okay. first full-time job? What should they be prepared to face? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, um, I've been now in the workforce workforce for about twenty years, mm -hmm. and so I'm a I'm of a different generation. And yet, through that time, I've had the real opportunity, as you mentioned, to be working with a cross um, section of of industries, especially when I was in consulting. Mm -hmm. And I think that being in consulting for fourteen years is really relevant to your um, your audience that's listening because that was my first job out of university and I was on the front line. And mm -hmm. so I was kind of um, being sent out to companies and working with clients and there wasn't a lot of discrimination, um, how do I say this? There wasn't a lot of thought in sending um, a young woman to an automotive client mm -hmm. where actually it might not be the environment that she could thrive in just from a diversity standpoint compared to if she maybe went to um, a consumer goods company or a luxury fashion company. Right. So um, there is an intentionality that 
you as the individual kind of have to have when you look at the first job that you're going into. Okay. But certainly, I would not hesitate to go into those types of, um, of industries if you're a woman and you want, you're an engineer, as mm -hmm. an example, you want to go into a male-dominated company because there are women who have gone there before you. Right. I can't stress that enough. Um, and when you have passion and when you have an intentionality that you show, you can find who those women are that can, and men, mm -hmm. that can help you thrive in your career. So it's I want to continue easy. on this. This is a very, mm -hmm. very juicy topic. So what, first of all, I get the sense that there's a culture that they would have to potentially break through. Mm -hmm. Bro culture, as they call it. What is yeah. bro culture, first of all? Is it real? And then does that mean that it should predicate them from avoiding certain business lines? Yeah, yeah, so business lines is great. I mean, I work in HR. Yeah. So the example I gave you was when I was on the line uh, as a salesperson in multiple industries. Now I work in HR where it's predominantly women. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I would, I would not, if I can understand your question correctly, I would not encourage women to simply go to departments where they know that they're not gonna have to face bro culture. Mm -hmm. um, Bro culture does exist. Okay. It exists in all types of industries. Um, you hear in kind of you hear the term bro grammar from um, the engineering side. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of software engineers. I can tell you that when a topic about diversity comes up, and I I coach 5,500 uh, engineers on this topic. Not every day, but mm -hmm. I have the privilege to work with them. They really want to make it right. So okay. even if they their culture has allowed them to be surrounded by mostly men and have this kind of mindset, the, the programmers and the engineers in particular are so process oriented mm -hmm. that when we do workshops about this topic, they are all in. Um, financial services is another one that still yes. is, and you you've yeah. witnessed it as well with your background. Um, in financial services, that's another one that requires. Um, a lot of attention to how a woman presents herself and then also why it necessitates being able to find mentors and champions that can guide you early and then as you even get more advanced in your career can open doors for you it's yeah so i don't want to put words in your mouth yeah, so sure. but i'm going to plead ignorance as a male first and foremost um, and i'm also going to plead ignorance because maybe i'm a little too idealistic for example, I have a two-year-old daughter, and I would like to think she will live in a world where her merit, her capability, her competency will drive her worth worthiness of a job opportunity. Should I be prepared to understand that it's not as simple as that, and there are factors that are still beyond her control that we're still fighting against? Yeah, so if she's two, I don't know what the landscape's going to look right. like in 20 years, but if she were... 20 years old now, then yeah, she would. She absolutely would have to face certain um, barriers. Again, it would depend on the industry she's mm -hmm. in, the degree to which those barriers would be in place. But I think, I think the very fact that she has a father who is woke to these types of topics gives her a significant advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's unfortunate for most women who feel as though they are needing to continue to fight the patriarchy, right. which is a very real thing, might not have had the opportunity to reflect and see that maybe it's not their father, but there are guys around them that have been great champions. Um, and they, the women, it's on the women also to be able to tap into who those men are. Right. Your daughter seems like a very lucky woman to be able Thank to you. do that. I certainly hope in 20 years it would be different. I. I, I don't know. I mean, I've now been working for 20 years. Right. Things have changed, but it's still, um, it's still tough. This is such a positive topic, so I want to stay on that theme, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge some of the events in the news recently. Absolutely. What should young women do to at least be aware of sexual harassment and to not let the purity of mentorship, allies, corner of the courts, be perversed or poisoned by someone who has ulterior motives. Yeah, yeah, so um, so certainly, so this is assuming then that the male mentor is not, hasn't read the manual and doesn't know and, and really is doing it for um, poor intentions. Right. Um, yeah, that's very difficult. And I think that for, from a practical standpoint, women and, and young women especially, when they are being mentored, um, have to put up boundaries and be comfortable putting up boundaries. And all the literature now that's coming out about how women and men can 
continue to have good relationships in the time of Me Too. They, they all say that. Mm -hmm. um, this is also why it's really important for women to know who they can ask for help. Um, that's something that I never did, um, independent of sexual harassment. I, I didn't realize that it's okay to reach out and ask for help. Um, so always, so not always, but it's very important to have mentors and women and men who you feel like you can go to. So a great example, a st our first story actually on the corner of the court, mm -hmm. which was just about a year ago. We launched on December 31st, Congratulations. 2016, thank you, um, was a woman named Megan and she was a, in the Merchant Marine Academy and she felt she was facing sexual harassment and her story about her male champion was a gentleman named Dave, and she had already sought him out and knew that he was someone that she could go to, that without any repercussions, she could report what she felt was being unfair. So um, I would really say that, we've talked about mentorship earlier in this conversation, mm -hmm. it's really important to find someone who you can trust. So making it a little bit more closer to home, who is the best mentor you've ever had, male or female? Oh, so um, there's been a lot. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot. Certainly my brother, um, because he's what the project has been right. inspired by, um, I would say I would say a gentleman named Craig, who, when I was doing this research, he had mentioned to me he was really excited. Um, I was new to the company that I was working with, and I had heard he was a great male ally. And he had recommended to me that I should think about interviewing, and he gave me some names. And one of the, one of the people was the chairman of a, of, of a financial services company. And I remember thinking like, okay, I'm, there, there's no way that I could ever interview him. Right. And so about a week and a half later, I sent Craig an email. I said, hey, you know, how would you feel about potentially making an introduction? Right. And I kid you not, within 45 minutes, I had two voicemails from Craig saying, Roshana, like, chairman's really happy to meet with you. That's and nice. he also then went out of his way, uh, Craig went out of his way to coach me on what I could say and some things I could do to make the best impression. That's a great example of mentorship and sponsorship before the corner of the court was even born that um, has led to, to right. me being able to find my calling. So he's been, he's been a great example. There's been lots more, but. So last question for this part of our two-part series, what advice would you give to our female viewers right now, whether they're entering their junior year or their senior year or they're about to enter the workplace, they're all within the same age level, they're all part of the same generation. What wisdom would you part onto them after almost 20 years in the industry? Yeah, I, I would say, I would give two pieces of advice. Um, the first is ask for help, and the second is get really good at the art of reflection. So I'll talk about um, the first one first, which is don't be afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I absolutely did not learn until probably about two years ago. And y as a professional woman, you're always going to be reinventing yourself. Yeah. And it's good when you are overwhelmed because it means that you're growing and you're being stretched, but you can only grow and stretch if you have someone who can kind of coach you through it. So um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Some, I mean, I, I don't know whether it was cultural or if it was just me thinking once I had hit a certain level in my career, I couldn't ask for help. And when I moved to Germany, and was running a big project with lots of different cultures um, at play, I, I didn't know what to do and it, I didn't handle it as effectively as I could. So I share that as an example of even at, you know, as someone in their mid thirties, still learning that right. lesson. So ask for help and find those mentors and then be really good at the art of self-reflection. It's really, I mean, again, I'm a psychologist, so reflection is also something that great male allies are really good at, but right. us as women, should also be really keen and understand that why are we picking the field that we're going into? Right. If setbacks happen, what is it that I'm learning from the setback? So get really good at journaling. Um, it's also a leadership skill. Again, 20 years ago, I would never have been able to use the word journaling in front of any of my workshops. Sure. And now leaders are starting to get it, both male and female. So getting really good at self-awareness and self-reflection is a gift that you could give yourself. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time in our second episode talking about the Corner of the Court, but if someone wants to learn more about it, where can they find you? Oh, great. So um, certainly cornerofthecourt.com mm -hmm. is where we have all of our women's stories. And that's probably the best, the best starting point I can be found on LinkedIn as well and my website. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is a wonderful topic and we look forward to continuing it on part two of State of Mind. Thank you, Krishna. 
On that note, that'll wrap up our show for today. I'd like to thank Roshana Bide for joining us and offering her unique perspectives on a very important topic. We'd also like to thank the Youth Channel's team for their support in this production. If you'd like to learn more about the Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel, please visit mnn.org slash youth. Additionally, if you like what you saw in today's episode, please feel free to like, share, comment, and subscribe on the following social media platforms at the end of the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night. Thank you.